chapter 3, in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chafe he will burn with unquenchable fire. So when we do biblical interpretation, we're looking at a passage, I think it always helps to think about these things in concentric circles, where at the heart of the biblical passage is God's word revealed to man speaking to us today. Uh, think about that as the center, okay? Um, now, we could go even deeper and talk about the glory of God, the glory of Christ, but, but for this exercise, we'll, let, let's start with this idea that the meaning of the text or the, the truth as in, revealed by God to us is, is, is the kind of the acorn that's at the heart of these circles. Now, on the outside circle, what we want to begin to do is think about the context, think about who's writing it and those sorts of things. And, we, and we've been doing that, right? We, we talked about this as Matthew writing mid-60s to Jewish Christians to make the claim that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. And once we begin to, to look at the context, that's the outer circle, we go, we go another circle inward. And that's how does this text fit within the context of Matthew? And, and as we've seen, Jesus, uh, Matthew is keen to show that Jesus is the Messiah King. Uh, he's a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, and he's giving us all these events of his first few years of life. Well, now we have fast-forwarded some 25 years, and Jesus is about to begin his public ministry. So this passage, we could say, is a hinge, a fulcrum between um, um, into, uh, you know, when it fast-forwards some 25 years, it doesn't mean those 25 years were unimportant, it just means that they weren't relevant to Matthew's particular argument, right? Jesus was probably living a very ordinary life. But here we have on the scene in the Old Testament prophetic tradition, um, some guy named John the Baptist coming and baptizing people. And so let's go down another concentric circle. What, what is John's central message? And his central message is repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, reorient your life. Um, change your focus, um, turn back your heart because God has come. He is appearing. It's now time to align your life with the values and the truth of his kingdom. Now, last week, we yesterday, we went another circle deep down and we said, well, there's kind of three groups of people here. There's the religious leaders, there's John the Baptist, and then there's the, the crowds. And each are responding in a different way to John's message. And now we're starting to get into the heart of really the center point of this text. And what I want to do today is to go down another concentric circle, because I don't think we can fit all of this together quite yet, which we're going to do tomorrow. Okay, that's Friday. Until we understand what is baptism here, what is the function of baptism and this requires us to do a little historical research. It requires us to maybe read a commentary or two. But here's what we can say for sure, that up to this point, there has been nothing quite like what we see happening in John's ministry in the life of greater Israel. In other words, 
this distinctive thing that John is doing called baptizing, which literally means to immerse or to go into, okay, baptism into water. We don't see this exact, this seems to be a new thing, okay? Now, in saying that, it doesn't mean that it didn't have Old Testament Judaic roots. It most certainly did. So if you traveled around Israel, you can still do this, by the way. You can go to the Qumran community, the Essenes, they're the remnants of their um, um, where they lived, and it's rumored or theorized that maybe John lived with these Essenes, but you can see these baptismal pools or these ceremonial cleansing pools um, that are still in existence. And we know that they had these around the temple area as well. And this is not so much where people would necessarily be immersed into water, but it was when you would go into a house or before you would go into worship or before you go into the synagogue, you would have you would wash yourself, okay, feet, hands, uh, maybe maybe pour over your head. It was both a, a, a hygiene thing, but it was really fundamentally um, a symbol of the fact that you are now ritually pure to enter into the presence of God, okay. Um, so so that that that's one piece of background here, okay. Uh, another piece of background is that sometimes when Jewish when Gentiles would would convert to Judaism, they would go through a set of rites of initiations, and they were it was called a proselyte initiation. And sometimes in those initiations, there would be some form of ceremonial cleansing, okay, that would mark the initiation into um, the, the, the Jewish people of God. Well, what Matthew is doing here, it certainly builds on those things, but this is something fundamentally radically different. And what's radically different about this particular baptism is that John is calling everybody to participate in it. So in other words, these are not just proselytes who are converting to Judaism who have to be, in, who have to be initiated. Um, the, 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 this is something everyone is called to do as a sign and symbol of their repentance before God. Now, What's interesting is here, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I. Um, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So here he's, he's pointing to the, the, the ministry of Jesus, that what Jesus is going to come and do is that he is going to bring both life and judgment, okay? the Holy Spirit and fire. And the Holy Spirit is the, the symbol of, or the metaphor here of life. And fire, of course, is always um, uh, the symbol for judgment, okay? So what John is saying is that this water that I am baptizing you in, one, I'm putting you all the way under, not just part of you, okay, right? I'm putting all of you under the water because this is a sign and seal of the cleansing the spiritual cleansing that Jesus will do when he comes, all right? So here we, we see, um, one, baptism is never meant as a means of salvation. It doesn't, there's nothing magical about those waters. There's nothing mystically significant about them. They are a rite, but in this case, they are an initiation rite into the kingdom of of God. And I think this tells us a couple of fundamental things about baptism. Um, one relates to why we believe, and this is our practice at Four Oaks and, and Reformed Baptist churches and Baptist churches all over the world, why we baptize believers and not um, infants, okay, or those entering the covenant of the kingdom. And the reason is because what John is saying here. And when he's reminding the Pharisees that um, just because they're physical children of Abraham, that does not gain them anything. Um, he's reminding them that what they really need is a spiritual cleansing of the heart. And now baptism doesn't remove sin, but it's the symbol of that removal of sin. And so, so what John is fundamentally telling us is that no longer is God gathering a people together along ethnic lines, 
Now the kingdom of God belongs to everyone who has faith and repents in Jesus Christ. And so, so here, we, we, we really believe that what John is doing is uniquely Christian, right? It, it's based in the Old Testament and Judaic laws and customs. It has forms and shadows. It draws from different traditions. But fundamentally, we are now moving from the old covenant to the new covenant. And the, the, the issue here is that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, did not see themselves as needing John's baptism. Why would we need John's baptism? We are already clean. We are already God's chosen people. And John is keen to emphasize here when he calls them brood of vipers that what God has come to fix is an internal um, reality. But again, it's this baptism, this public baptism, which is the lightning rod for, um, for, for all this controversy, right? Because John is doing a new thing. Now, Interestingly enough, and this is just a, a this is probably what's what's happened. So let's think of let's fast forward now three years at Pentecost when when Peter is preaching and he says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. Well, these are all people who are at the temple area, and we have to ask, where were they being baptized? Where where was the water? Well, most likely, and you can still see this when you visit Israel you can see the remnants of all of the old um, ceremonial cleansing pools that surrounded the temple area. And most likely what happened is that as people were confessing faith in Jesus Christ, they were coming into those ceremonial cleansing pools and they were being immersed into this new Christian community, the new kingdom. And again, it's all part of the, the old wineskins, the new wineskins, it's all part of the fact that God, it's an old covenant now, it's a new covenant. And let's not miss the significance of what John is doing here. This is radically new. He's calling the people of Israel to examine their hearts, to examine their, their relationship with God. The, uh, a relationship that's not based anymore on externals, but one primarily internally. And it's this tension, right? that causes the, the Jewish leaders to come. It says they, they, they come to check it out. They don't come to get baptized, right? And so again, just a little application point, and then we'll be done for today. In order to receive the grace of Christ, the grace of God, you have to, must see your need for grace. You must see your sinfulness. You must see, you know, and, and so when you downplay sin, you downplay grace. You downplay Christ and your need for him. This is why there is this idea that the people came confessing their sins. Okay, so there we are. We're, 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 home, we're, we're coming down the home stretch. Tomorrow, we're going to try to sort of bring all of this together and sort of talk about what, what are... What are some some specific application points for um, the exegesis and the exposition that we have been doing? Encourage you to continue to read through this passage, to study this passage, consult your commentary, consult your your study Bible that I recommended that that you buy. And I think this is hopefully a, a model that will be helpful for you um, studying the Word of God for yourself going forward. Let me pray. Lord, we ask now that you would um, wash away all of our sin. Lord, you've done that through Jesus, but, can, but show us our continual need to come before you to confess those sins, trusting that you will cleanse us and purify us from all unrighteousness. Lord, this water doesn't do it, um, but it's a powerful sign and symbol of what the blood of Jesus does in our hearts. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody.